I'm here with comedian Ricky Glor discussing his upcoming film, uh, All Your Friends Are Dead, a slasher film by way of mental health horror inflicted on us by everyday life. All Your Friends Are Dead had its premiere back in July and is currently touring the film festival circuit. Uh, you'll be able to catch it next at the Horror Movie Freaks Film Festival. Ricky, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, let's start by talking about the movie. Uh, why don't you just tell us all uh, what All Your Friends Are Dead is. Uh, all your fr- Yeah, I said it right. <laughs> all Your Friends Are Dead. Very long title. Yeah. We were saying like for our next feature, we should do the exact opposite where we should have it as be, be one word. And at one point we were like, well, maybe we should make like a so completely disregarding of whatever story would be or whatever would make the next best feature film for us as far as like micro budget and feasibility and what we're excited about. We're like, we should make a a dead trilogy. Maybe they're not like connected, but every title is long and has the word dead somewhere in there. Um, And then we, of course, we're not going by the way of any of those reasons of why we should make the next thing we make. Um, But I wish I would have had the synopsis uh, pulled up because the synopsis that we currently have on IMDb and for our festival submissions via film freeway is the most succinct way to synopsize the film. And it was written by one of the earliest people that uh, reviewed the movie. And we've done this twice. Now we've borrowed from people that have written better things about the movie than the movie itself. When we were first doing the Kickstarter, um, there was a website, I think it's horror DNA. Okay. Dot com. Yep. I, don't, I feel bad that I, I don't know right off the top of my head, but my press release that I wrote, because again, very micro budget movie, made it for $5,959. So everyone involved wore many hats um, and too many hats for myself. My head is very large, so the hats are very big. <laughs> but so they did a, uh, an article promoting the Kickstarter to help us finish the movie. And my original press release was, well, what if the breakfast club became the big chill and went camping in a Friday, the 13th movie, they succinctly made it. So you wouldn't have to know any of those movies and wrote it as what if the teen slasher movie grew up? And I was like, Oh shit, that is way better. You don't have to have seen breakfast club. You don't have seen big chill. You don't have to have seen any Friday the 13th movie. I was like, that's, the best way to say it so we we grabbed that and rewrote all of our press releases and started putting that out there so big thanks to them uh similarly to whoever synopsized the movie better than we did on our original press release i'm gonna pull it up so i read it we we borrowed that because we were like again this is the most succinct way to um i think it's ironic i'm talking about succinctly describing the movie and I'm taking a half an hour <laughs> to describe the movie. I'm going to say, there's going to let you go. Yeah. Get this all okay. in editing. <laughs> all your friends are dead. After, no, no, got to leave all this in there. Uh, after, because uh, also I will chase rabbits. So you are going to have to hone me in on this. This isn't going to be a guest that you're going to have to be like squeezing a rock for water from. Uh, I will keep on talking. After making the drastic decision to end his life, Matt Wilby writes an email alerting his estranged high school friends that he will be saying goodbye for good at the camping grounds where they've gathered in the past. Matt's friends arrive just in time to save his life, ellipses. But little do they know, a deranged mass killer is lurking in the woods, ready to pick them off one by one. All your friends are dead. Dun, dun, dun. Yes. Bam, bam, bam. And you've seen the movie. I have, so- yes. And do not hold back. Don't feel like you're glad handing me. Don't feel like if you said a harsh thing that I would be like, this interview is over. Click. <laughs> um, I don't think that. Uh, I mean, obviously n- feel talks. free, feel free to nitpick because people know, like also your review is on your website and it is one of the first extensive reviews that we, we received of the movie. And one of the biggest things that uh, Nick Hines, the co-director and co-story author, uh, him and I were proud of is we had people like you and a couple other reviewers um, look at the movie and then give their two cents, um, including Vincent Pereira, who has worked with Kevin Smith and is a USQ historian. Um, him and I chat every now and then, and he gave me his notes, a lot of them technical, which is really cool. Um, 
But every note and everything in a review of criticism that we've received, we have set ourselves. And so the, the thing that I like about that is that means luckily, I think we're not delusional thinking the movie is better in some areas than it is. Every bit of criticism that has been slung in its direction, we were like, yep, we think that too. So I feel glad about that. There's never been something that's been uh, criticized that we are like, what? No, that's amazing. Like, fuck them. <laughs> no, I, I think that you're going overboard a little bit. Um, I like the movie. Um, I, I actually, I think I've watched it two or three times now just to, in order to prepare for this interview and things of that nature as well. Um, and the thing is, is I was uh, earlier today trying to catch up, trying to, uh, you know, even get through it again. Um, I was I like that you up... said get get through it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get through it again before it's the end. 90, <laughs> it's 93 minutes, John. Like it's not that hard to get through. No, well, no. It's technically like 85 minutes, and then the mid credit sequence, and then the credits. Yeah, no, it's that's not what I meant at all. <laughs> I just meant trying to get it, trying to watch it all before this interview. Yeah. Um, but um, that was a thing. Was um on watching it again, one of the scenes that, that got to me was Matt's flashback scene. And it hadn't hit me before. Like, um, it, it never uh, got to me how much uh, dread soaked that scene is that the black and white sequence where he, he starts picturing um, all his friends in the yearbook talking to him mm -hmm. and uh, going into the school itself. Um, but it's so, it sort of, it sort of goes in two lanes. One with character development for those people that you knew in high school are they the same? Will they accept you the same way? And then in um, sort of the idea of, of what happens later in the film and uh, what does potential actually look like uh, depending on who you are and that, that sort of break that you might have as a person. Well, and, and for me, it's the, the people that, that deal with depression, um, what they perceive other people's thoughts of them are regardless of having a conversation or any bit of insight to their psyche of what a stranger or even someone that you're once familiar with does think of you. I think uh, depression, um, my, my brother's a psychiatrist. So anything that I, that I say that it sounds remotely astute as far as um, a, a diagnosis is, is from, is from him and the communications we've had as a family, but People that put themselves down, they project usually that other people have these thoughts of them that never have existed, have never been other, uttered, have never been a thought in their heads. And I think Matt Wilby classically goes through that of these are all his own thoughts that he has about himself. And I think that is indicative. I mean, there's a couple scenes in the, the, long, the long guy scene and the uh, the the woman who comes, the pregnant woman who comes to the bar, you get glimpses of that, but then you also see a break in his own psyche that maybe not, maybe Matt Wilby's not the most reliable narrator in his 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 depression in his mental uh, facilities. That the 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 bar scene I think is the first time that you see where like oh okay maybe there is a breakdown that is going on that isn't in the reality that really exists. Um, Matt is kind of creating his own reality. And then, you know, that's why the dream sequence happens right after, after that is because he's starting, starting to have his breaking point. And for me, um, the long guy scene in my mind is the last scene that exists in any sort of reality. Everything else is kind of um, a bad, a, um, an unreliable narrator. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, now that's- And that's, and that's and the, the, just to, and this wasn't even discussed, a lot of things, especially in micro budget filmmaking, uh, the biggest uh, piece of advice that I can give to anybody, uh, we had some people that came out to the Cincinnati premiere at the Esquire Theater which is a beautiful independent theater in, in Clifton, Ohio, near University of Cincinnati, that I grew up going to see all the independent movies at. Um, awkwardly, the worst one that I saw, not because of bad movie, but worst experience was Autofocus with Greg Kinnear playing um, 
oh, I can't think of his name from Hogan's Hogan's Heroes. Heroes, yeah. Yes. And it's a <laughs> it's a bunch of like hardcore sex scenes. I saw that with my parents when I was like 12. Um, that was a weird movie to see in a movie theater where you can't escape or leave the room. Um, I saw Sideways with my sister, so I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> just that Thomas Hayden yeah. shirt scene where he's like just railing her from behind. Probably not a scene you want to see with your sister. Uh, or Paul Giamatti having any sort of sex or talking about sex. Yeah, right? Probably don't want to. Um, but, but so the two things happened from the Esquire, Esquire screening where we found that the movie is way more intentionally funny than we thought it was in areas that we didn't expect to get laughter, um, which is a double-edged sword. We think that will hurt us for festival submissions because most of our festival submissions have been horror-based. And we think the movie is probably should be listed as a comedy first and then horror. Um, And you don't get that sense of how well the comedy plays unless you're in a group setting with an audience. Um, Not... That's not an excuse for why we haven't gotten picked for some festivals, but that's just something that has happened now that I've had two public screenings of the movie. Going back to the dream sequence and the break in the reality, this wasn't discussed, but when you're doing micro budget filmmaking for anyone who wants to make a movie, and everybody can now because we have very good cameras on our phones uh, and editing software that is very cheap or free, the filmmaking process is a puzzle and every iteration of it is a puzzle. We wrote the script, then we looked over the script and we said, okay, how can we alter it to to make the tone more consistent or how Nick Heinz and I wanted to bring both of our sensibilities together together to then make the film. Um, One of the the things that we did was we're like, okay, we need to have a dedicated at least one actor where we could have that one actor in almost every scene. Who would that be? And I was like, well, I guess that's me. And so that's why I was in it and wore that hat. Um, But as you're putting the puzzle together, after you film the thing, you start seeing what works and you start constructing in the best way possible. And that may look entirely different from what you originally planned in that first stage. And then when you start getting other entities involved, like music and sound and the mixing, Braden Firebrand, who did the mixing and did some additional original score When you go into the dream sequence, there's already a little bit of carnival music that happens at the beginning that I think lets the viewer know, okay, this movie's not 100% serious. We just watched a guy very bloody hop into a car, take a shower, and then the first break in uh, in the seriousness is Matt falling out of the truck. But in the two public screenings that I've seen, that doesn't get the biggest laugh. The biggest laugh that happened at the exact same moment, at the exact same veracity of laugh, was when Matt um, slurps up the whiskey from the table. It got the same like charge of laugh both times. But so then there's that carnival music that's like, okay, this movie's not going to take itself too seriously. Um, when it shifts into the dream sequence, without having a conversation, he did something that I'm like, oh yeah, we go from color to black and white. It's almost reverse Wizard of Oz. But the music itself almost has that dun, 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 that like kind of carnival fair high school rah 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 sis boom ba oh. feel. That I was just like, oh, this is brilliant. If only we were cognizant of when we were writing it or doing it to lean into the Wizard of Oz aspect of that. All of his high school friends represent the cowardly lion. That they represent the scarecrow. That they represent the t- like that would have been so smart. I'm happy to say if anybody picks up on some some subtext that they think is there, it's not. It's just a happy accident that these different iterations of putting this puzzle together of an independent film and the different creatives that came in, they found different things and highlighted some areas, I think, to make them work better than they were originally intended to. Like I said, I just ended up watching you know, today with... Uh, sort of a different gaze on that sequence and and it was uh it was sort of terrifying it was you know um because it's it, it is sort of one of those things that you know deep down i think that we all kind of think about um you know i'm what on nearly 25 years out from my reunion right so <laughs> like from from way back in high school days and it's like if i went back and saw those people you know it's the same idea you know what 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 might I find? Um, 
And what would you think that they think of you and your station in life? Like, have you succeeded? Have you not succeeded? Does de facto you being there mean that you haven't succeeded? <laughs> Right, because like if Personally, you had succeeded, I, I you probably so, wouldn't. Be I'm there. still hoping for a little more, for sure. Yeah. Do you have um, like a checklist of things that you want to accomplish? So like when you go to that reunion, you're like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm this. Oh, but, I'm. But that's the thing is, um, I don't think I'd ever go to a reunion personally, um, only because it, it's it's both ways. Either you don't feel accomplished, or you feel over accomplished, right? And then you don't want to throw it in other people's faces. And I'm that person. I'm. Yeah, neurotic to it. <laughs> yeah, you thought you thought of all avenues that there's too many things that kind of like heed you going to a reunion. One hundred. And everything that I want to see, everybody that I want to see, I still see. I still Same. stay in contact with them. Yeah, one hundred percent. Me too. Um, a lot of my friends still live in the area, so I mean, we hang out. That's yeah. That's it. I I wanted to ask you about the Harold's Hardware scene because to me that is my that is my favorite scene in the movie. Um, I think that you just nailed it. Uh, it's it, it's just full of life's little annoyances in a deeply dark uh, comedic um, premise. And um, is there is there a frustrating retail story like that that you have that sort of helped create that, or was that just like a communal like response to to that idea? I've worked so many different jobs in customer service, whether it be uh, as a waiter numerous times or as a cash register ringer or a baggage person at a grocery store. I don't like being a regular at places. And mainly just because I don't want to have to have, for the same reason that I don't like, like family reunions where you're seeing family members that you, you don't stay in contact with. And the first thing that like their icebreaker of conversation is the last thing they remember you both talking about or the last thing they remember seeing about you. And so this is this weird catch up where un like, unlike my high school friends who there are a couple that I'm really good friends with, but there are stretches of time we don't talk to each other. But when we do see each other, it, it falls back very easily into the old rigmarole of like, we're just enjoying each other. We're not having to placate one another with being like, so I know you have kids. Are they smart? Are they dumb? Are they good? Like, are you happy with them? Um, it's just very easy and it's naturalistic. Uh, that's why I don't like being a regular at places because working in the service industry, I know most people like having, you know, that you know about them and even the surface level things of like, oh, you come into the speedway to buy this kind of cigarette. I will have that cigarette ready for you to make you think that I care about you. I don't care about, like, I don't, I don't want to have that. I just want to, like a waiter at a restaurant. I don't need to create a personal bond with that person. I just need them to do the job and be pleasant. So the Harold's hardware scene, um, Mike Flincham, who I think is incredibly funny, who wore a lot of hats in this movie as well, who plays Bob. Um, that is his actual hydraulic store in Kentucky that we, did a very minimal facelift to look yeah, like a Yeah, I was going to say that it didn't look particularly like a hardware store. <laughs> but like we leaned into the jokes of that. He's like, yeah. aisle one, do you want me to show you where that is? And it's like, there's one aisle. Like yeah. there is not <laughs> yeah, any exactly. other aisles. Um, <laughs> it looks sad, like Max life. Like it, it looks a little bit like a, a waiting for Godot situation of just like if Matt didn't leave that hardware store and the rest of the movie took place in that hardware store, I think you'd kind of buy it because that maybe is now his new purgatory. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but all of that is scripted, not improvised. Um, there is one point where Mike, who plays Bob, turns and goes to get the second rope after that long pause. And you can see his script sticking in his back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> that is the long pieces of paper that are in his back pocket. Uh, that took that scene took many takes to do. Uh, we we cracked up a lot. We did it so many times that if you go to the second Harold's Hardware, um, you can see strangling Bob. That uh, 
I'm mouthing, oh, hey. I'm actually going, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey. <laughs> because we filmed that initial scene so many times, I heard him say, oh, hey. Like, oh, hey, welcome to Harold's Hardware. Can I help you find anything? Oh, hey, welcome to Harold's Hardware. So oh. then when we filmed that second scene, I improvised that thinking like, well, yeah, the audience has heard it so much. It's, it's Bob's catchphrase. And then when we were editing, we're like, oh, no, you only hear it once because, yeah, we filmed it a lot, but the audience isn't seeing all those takes. That's not a catchphrase. we got to take out the audio here. That doesn't make any sense. Um, but yes, all that stuff is the unaffected customer service person who, like, if they don't say their script of, like, we have this membership thing, they're going to get fired. They're going to lose their job. And like, Bob doesn't want to go through any of this, but he has to. And like, is he a stoner? Is he a little Asperg, Asperger's he? Like, who knows? But yes, a joy of watching those scenes uh, in front of an audience twice now has been great because those scenes definitely were intended for laughs and they have got, they have gotten the laughs both times, which it, it feels good being, you know, a stand-up comedian um, or just working in comedy, seeing stuff that you intended to be humorous play off as humorous is very rewarding. Okay. So that scene and a few others, uh, like the YouTube uh, knickknack and not scene, and even Greg's character, um, they kind of speak to the idea of uh, getting a commercial spot response instead of a human one uh, when you go looking for one. Um, is there is there an implied idea of sort of uh, callousness in the world and, and just people that don't understand or, or anything like that, like mentally speaking? A lot of the humor and then like a lot of the stuff that deals with suicide or depression, we wanted to come at with a, an earnest um, approach because we didn't ever want it to make it look or feel like that we were mocking depression or suicide, even though we know you anytime that you infuse humor with anything that is traumatic, there are going to be some people who knee jerk to it, who completely like shut it off or, or just like put up a front before, because they're like, well, Oh, you're mixing comedy and this dealing with suicide. I'm, I'm out. Like, I don't want to hear whatever you have to say, because I don't feel like there's anything humoristic to mine from that. Um, when I looked to build the props of, because one of the props once Matt is hanging himself, to be safe for me, the actor, because I was going to be doing it, was a metal rod through a, a noose. So it looks like it's standing straight up and it's, it's going up and wasn't connected to anything. So if I were to fall as the actor, I wouldn't be attached to anything. The whole apparatus that I was wearing just goes with me. It's just the metal rod and the rest of the rope was out of frame above that you couldn't see. But when I, I typed in Google, how do you tie a noose? The first thing that came up was suicide prevention hotline, the number that we put at the end of the film after the credits. And uh, I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I had to look up a YouTube tutorial to figure out how to tie the noose. And that was another instance of Nick Hines and I, one of the scenes that it's like, okay, it's just you and I, we have a lot of these and that helps fill out the movie because we only have to rely on each other. We don't need a cast. Um, to be part of this we were filming that in the woods and i was like shit okay uh, i gotta tell you another news i don't remember how to do it i'll go to the youtube video that i looked up and that wasn't in the script and nick's like oh this should be part of this because we're not making fun of suicide this is earnest this is humanistic like probably this is how people get things done like even when things come with instruction manuals like i have a three-year-old daughter anytime that i built anything for her i have had the instruction booklet but i've also looked at a youtube tutorial to like just see the pieces come together and see someone else uh, a human touch to it put it together so we were like all right well let's roll camera on me watching the video and then we'll overdub which that's nick's voice doing the knickknack and knots um, for that part. We're like, we think this is funny because this is, this is honest and this is relatable. Yeah. But again, there could be people that watch it. And as soon as you dip your toe into depression or suicide, and then you add a little taste of humor, they're just like, no, 
Like, I don't find that funny. I'm not going to laugh at this. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think in horror, we're, we're dealing with elements of people literally murdering each other all the time. So it's sort of... Uh, you have to have some sense of, of desens- <laughs> like You have to have some desensitization yes. to like, what is happening. And I, it's weird that you say that. Like the, the, the next script that I'm working on for our next feature, I started examining that because uh, I was like, well, you know, why... Why is it so easy to write someone getting their throat slashed or brutally murdered? Like, I don't write anything like brutally rape because that's almost torture. And that's, uh, to me, that is a, a different sense of horror that I'm like, oh, I don't want to go there. Yeah, no, I, I get uh, But in, in the same vein, like my wife, uh, I have a joke about this on my first album is we'll be watching a horror movie and kids will be getting like kids, old people, middle-aged people will be getting killed left and right. But as soon as they show a dog into a horror movie, my wife is like, Nope, don't want to see that. <laughs> and it's just like, that's interesting. Why? Like, why does that when we can, we completely cut off our disbelief of being like, this is a movie and this is not real. But then when an, a helpless animal appears, we then all of a sudden care. Yeah. about its demise yeah no i i get you 100 there the um that that to me is sort of you know we well we can't do this but we can do this and you go why don't we just talk about it because it just, it's more or less like we're um we're not being honest with ourselves <laughs> you know? yeah <laughs> all right because yeah, we would we would never we would never just want to watch a snuff film if you were told oh it's kind of like the blair witch project thing of like or uh, um, Fargo. Fargo is a great example where um, I was just recently listening to a podcast. I think it was Best Movies Never Made. And the, when the host was talking about going and seeing Fargo in the theater and was laughing because Fargo has a lot of funny moments. Yeah. And some people were looking at him like, oh, you, oh, that's so gross. Because at the beginning of the movie, they put this is a true story, which is a complete bogus lie to yeah. give it more weight to it. And he's like, no, he's like, this, there is a lot of comedic elements in this. It is okay to laugh. But perfect, perfectly what it did was polarize the audience, some of them, to find the horrific elements more serious because like, oh, shit, this is real. Kind of like Texas Chainsaw. That opening narration done by John Larquette, which that's amazing. When that's happening, you get a sense of, and then following that, the documentary feel of the movie, the look and the grittiness. You're just like, oh, fuck, this is a retelling of something that actually happened. This makes it infinitely more scary. I'm going to see more things than I actually see on screen. Like Texas Chainsaw, I think you see almost little to no blood until the end. And it's just like on scratches and cuts on people. But like you think that like when the hook goes in the girl's back, when she gets put on there by Leatherface, like... I always remember seeing like gushes of blood coming down and there's nothing. I think that that's, you know, I think most things based on a true story or anything like that, most of it's bogus anyway. It's <laughs> all been redone for Hollywood. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you really want to get a sense of that, read a, read a book. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, really the, the last thing I did want to ask you about was, was what was next. And you started um, going in on that. Um, I always have something. I will write a, a post-it note or I'll put a note in my phone or I'll even write, uh, even more classically, I'll write like 35 to 40 pages of something. And then I'll send it to someone, a, a trusted friend or whatever that reads a lot of stuff and we'll talk about it and we'll hash it out. And then I will reevaluate it being like, okay, is there life to this? Am I still excited after getting in that kind of like first and second act, I have a real hard problem of moving from the second act to the third act, which is a little evident in all your friends are dead. Some of that is from how we filmed it. Cause we filmed the middle of the wood stuff first. And then we filmed the beginning and the end. Um, the biggest issue I think with all your friends are dead is the tonal shift where there's some surrealism from the first half an hour that ramps up and then resets in the middle and it tries to get more melodramatic and more honest and more real. Because when we filmed the, the wood stuff first, I was like, Oh, Friday the 13th films. I hate that all the kills happen in the last half an hour. 
or the, all the cool kills happen in the last half an hour and the characters are two dimensional. So with this, I want to make the characters people that have backstories and that you, you, you relate to and that you care for. So when they die, you care when they die. Ultimately, all of our kills happen in the last half an hour. <laughs> and yeah, maybe you find out some more about the characters, but I, I really don't think you fucking care. Like for the most part, um, it's like, oh, that's some interesting information about that character. She has cancer. Like, and that's nice. But once you've gotten to that point in the movie, you're really just caring about Matt Wilby. The only glimpse of the characters you've got were in the dream. Um, but so all of the ideas for the possible next feature film that we have. I'm zeroing in on making sure that the tone is consistent from beginning to end, that if there is some tonal shifts that they're happening and then roller coastering more to the end, not going like, Oh, and then, and then, Oh, because the, I think the beginning of all your friends are dead and the end of all your friends are dead. Definitely feel like the same movie where the middle feels like its own different kind of thing. Um, the thing we're working on right now that is most likely to happen based on budget and probability of getting it together is uh, an idea called roadkill where succinctly it is what if Smokey and the Bandit were a horror movie? So if someone in a black 77 black Trans Am picked up a bride on a broken down back road where she thought she was escaping one nightmare and finding her knight in shining armor, it actually turned into a different kind of nightmare, kind of like um, the Hitcher a little bit, yeah. but the role is reversed. Where Rudger Hauer is more the person who picks up the bride instead of, yeah. 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 Um, but so, one of the the projects we were looking to do because I'm very music centric, uh, and I love the soundtrack to All Your Friends Are Dead, is to do a musical because that's what I was doing in Chicago. When I met my wife, we were producing these independent um, small budgeted black box theater musicals. And I started writing a musical about a pool monster, kind of like a, um, a creature from the black lagoon, but ha that appears in like a community pool. So a little bit of little shop of horrors meets shape of water. And I was writing that and wanting, really, really wanting that to be the next project. And Nick Hines being like, I'm not into musicals, but this is very different and weird. And maybe this, this could get some eyes on it that we might not normally get from just doing a straight up slasher um, or suspense thriller. And it turns out, yes, a musical would have all those things, but also takes a lot more prep and a lot more, people involved to make it happen. So I don't think that is what is going to happen next. Roadkill um, is the more feasible thing. And we're going to be hopefully fingers crossed shooting a trailer, a proof of concept to get the rest of our investments to make the feature in 2023. Uh, we're looking to shoot the trailer in October. So do you have any like last minute questions of what your least favorite thing was the, or uh, something that happened in the movie, you're just like, I don't understand this. Because we have two minutes and 37 seconds. <laughs> yeah, so. I know. I got it too. <laughs> um, no, so that's the thing is, I think that you're, I think the movie plays out well. I think that there's some, I think that there's a few things that you can combine in the first and second act that might have helped that a little bit better. Even if it was just traveling to, to see the other characters in their sort of, uh, you know, sort of morose lifestyle. Like we get to know those characters just a little too late, like you said. But yeah. um, for the most part, um, I, I'd say that the only thing that, and I think that we've already talked about this, was um, you can tell that there's theater staging, and it's because all yeah. of you <laughs> stay in a line as opposed to go three dimensional. It's very proscenium, as yes. if there is a <laughs> stage that isn't. Run. And a lot of that has to do with me being in the scene. Uh, that is my. Um, that is my experience with is theater directing. Yeah. So directing that way is very theater. Um, Vinnie Pereira pointed out, and again, it's something that we had already thought of after the fact was he's like, Oh man, I wish that during the police interrogation scene, which I will say 
That was the interrogation room of the Bellevue uh, Kentucky Police Department. And so, yes, in hindsight, we should have found a library somewhere that has like a big like glass window that looks more like an interrogation room and not someone's coat closet. <laughs> but like we were so excited that they let us film there yeah. knowing what the movie was because we didn't lie. We're like, it's a slasher film and it's a comedy and blah, blah, blah. Um, that, that, that is their interrogation room. But he's like, I wish you would have flashed back to actually seeing <laughs> commit the murders. And we were like, yeah. It, when we were done and everything, we're like, we wish we would have too when we had everyone there. And we have a little bit of that in the dream sequence where you see shirtless, like slash and whatever. Yeah. That's a little bit of a foreshadowing. But yeah, we wish we would have seen like the bifurcation of Greg like happen on camera or the, the chest slashing across both Larry and Lori. That would have been cool. I, I honestly like don't see anything in there. Like I watch a lot of um, underground and micro budget in lo-fi films um so it's not like like i know what to expect i suppose like i know that it's not going to be hollywood style you know but it, it's that's fine that's kind of the charm of of those kind of features for me and the thing is is there's so much more creativity and ingenuity in trying to do things in those films um you said before that a lot of the things that you uh you talk about with your brother um, come back to uh, the ideas that people tear themselves down or think about things that people that um, might say to them or, or will say to them. And I get your film is your baby, you know, like you got the chance to make this and, and all that. So you're thinking like a lot of those, those bad, you know, bad things ahead of time. And the thing is your movie's great. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I think audiences are, are really going to enjoy it too. I don't think that you have to worry about anybody tearing down things on it. I really appreciate that. I mean, being someone who is in the theater scene, it is, you are always wondering, I don't think that I'm a paranoid person, but I, and maybe this is a way to explain my paranoia and to protect myself. But I, I like to think of a bunch of different hypotheticals of the outcomes and not necessarily weigh in on those of like, well, the, you, here are the, all the bad hypotheticals, and I'm not thinking of the bad ones as if to protect myself for it. when the inevitability of the bad outcome or the non-favorable outcome happens. I've, I've thought about it, so now I'm prepared and it'll hit less hard. But when you're auditioning for stuff or you're submitting writing packets um, to like numerous different sketch shows or late night shows, the chances of you getting picked, it's it's a lot of luck. It's a lot about networking. It's about who, you know, um, I think about that and I understand that. And it still is hard when you get that rejection notice, but so much of like what you do as a creative is not in your hands that the best thing I learned in college as an improviser, as a theater major and a creative writing minor was if you're not getting cast and the shows are in the roles that you want to be in, make your own thing. And I was like, and I was already doing that to a degree. We were, Nick Hyans and I, the co-director of All Your Friends Are Dead, we did a cable access sketch comedy show that aired for um, uh, three or four different half hour episodes on our local cable access channel. And we were filming different short films and stuff on the weekends or whenever we could. We did a, for one of my final projects in one of my math classes in college, we did an instructional video about the metric system and conversions and stuff that was hosted by me playing Sean Connery, which was basically Daryl Hammond's Sean Connery. Um, and that's the only way I passed that class because I'm awful at math. But like, we were always doing what we wanted to do. And then in theater, I wasn't, I was auditioning and not getting on the college improv team. I wasn't getting cast in any of the shows because I had, honestly, I hadn't paid my dues. And I was a uh, an English major at that time and I had switched to theater majors. So like that was, a lot of it is politics and I'm not saying that in a bad way, but like even when I went to Chicago, my goal was, okay, follow the trajectory that's going to get me working on Saturday Night Live in some way. So like the first month I lived there, I was working for Second City as a waiter. So being around the atmosphere as much as possible. I had already signed up for improv Olympic classes, which anybody that knows the history of SNL, a lot of people come through that venue. 
I got to see Lorne Michaels and Seth Meyers and Craig Shoemaker sit and watch shows for auditions for possible new writers and cast members. And I was like, oh, I'm so close to it. But then as you grow and you get older and your priorities change and you start discovering who you are, your priorities and who you are aren't dictated by these outside forces that you think are who you are. I mean, this doesn't happen for everybody, but I'm very fortunate that I was just like, oh, you know what makes me happy is writing this, doing this, staging this, knowing that I can write this because taking some of my experience from stand-up being my favorite thing about stand-up and stand-up is not my favorite artistic expression whatsoever. I much rather do a play or a movie where you have the community experience and you have the ensemble uh, input is to spend time on something and watch something grow. It's almost like architecture that you're building a house and you're building it with all these people. And by the time you're done, you all have this ownership and this feeling of like, fuck, we did it. It took all this time, but this is it. And now it will live as this. And that even that thing can evolve. So like stand up is so stand up and improv is improv. You get a little bit more of a community feel, um, communal feel with the people that you're doing it with. But as soon as it's done, it's done. There's really no more life to it. It's very fleeting. It's very much like having sex. Like you're excited, you're in the moment, and you're hoping that everybody's enjoying what's going on, but you really don't know if they are or not. It can be very selfish. But as soon as it's done, it's over. For like a play and a movie, the prep time and stuff. But what I get from stand-up is as soon as I have an idea, if I have a show coming up, I can put that idea on stage and see if it flies or not. And I can vamp on it and I can work it. So what I love is coming up with a bunch of ideas and knowing that filmmaking is a lot easier now. I can go, okay, well, if I plan this and I'm excited about it, I can get enough people behind me. We can make this happen. And that's what I did with my two short films, Call and Racist, that I was like, okay, I did these. I know that I can get functionally a good amount of people that can make this thing kind of resemble what films are like that's why nick heinz and i pushed ourselves to make the movie all your friends are dead we sat down one day and we're like trying to think of a story and we're like okay we're 35 year olds some people might look back on their life like after high school because you think of life in chunks and you go well do i have any regrets and we're like no we don't have any regrets 10 years from now what would be a regret Oh, a regret would be if we never forced ourselves to make a feature length movie. And so it's like, great, let's do it. What would that movie be? And then we start parlaying all these ideas that we were talking about, like regrets and the evolution of who you are from high school. And like, does that dictate who you are? Should you still be that person? Like, because no one should be, and this is my opinion, no one should represent who they were from high school. If you still are carrying that costume of who you were then, like molecularly, every seven years you change. You should not be that same person at 35 that you were when you were 18. You should have evolved in some way. So that is, that is pretty much all the gestations of that went into All Your Friends Are Dead. And a lot of it is semi-autobiographical because... I did play sports. Um, I did hurt my knee junior year playing football and then immediately went into theater because I was like, oh, I have time for theater now. I was always part of choir. I just never had time to audition for things and be in it because I was playing football, baseball, and wrestling. Oh, I get that. I um, I did theater my, for four years, but then I went to football <laughs> for, for a year as well. So I get it. Um, Which, I mean, you're playing a part, right? Like a lot of that is is like wearing a different costume and like you have to buy in it because if you do it half-assed like it's not going to be as fun like you kind of have to like ritualistically join everything that comes with what it is of playing that sport to like lose yourself in it um even if you're in a play or i mean even a movie too you're playing that part and you were so hardcore in it. And with that group of friends and those people's for that finite amount of time that you're in it. But then like a, a week after the show close closes, you forget a lot of the people that you were with. And like, you don't like 
Yep, that was that. It's a very microcosm of the experiences of like high school and college where like you start it and you feel like a freshman, you're getting to know people. Um, a, a show, a movie or a play can very much be like that because you're with those people every day for such a long period of time. They see you at your emotional highs. They see you at your emotional lows. They know you better than anyone else. But as soon as that thing ends, some of those people become strangers. Yeah. Um, you're talking about like watching these different micro budgeted movies. And when we talk about micro budget, it doesn't irk me because I, I have an understanding of, of, of films. I love when I hear about low budget movies and they're like, it was a low budget movie, super low budget movie. It was $5 million. Oh uh, yeah. yeah just no. like <laughs> With Johnny Depp or something. And it's just like, fuck you. No, what, what I really like um, about like your film and um, there's another director in Canada. Uh, you may have seen it advertised at some film festivals. It's called Honeycomb. Mm-hmm. Um, the, these movies are like, I think, she, I think she did her movie for like two grand and it was all just her friends and everything else. And they just shot it when they could out in Canada and just, that was it. And um, the thing that I like about them is it's sort of, it's sort of the anti-Hollywood mentality. It's the thing that everybody wants from movies, but then when it comes, they kind of like to tear it down. Oh, well, it wasn't like this or it's, you know, all that. But um, it- because you get used to, you get used to the glitz and the glamour and the ease of things when you watch them. And I feel like um, there are some people that are like, well, why do you spend so much time watching the schlock? Like whether it be 70s schlock or 80s schlock or even I'm a, I stay a little bit away from the 90s schlock because it doesn't have as much of the charm because it does lean into the CGI or, you know, yeah. 80s and 70s. I could watch a bad 80s or 70s and maybe even 60s, maybe even 50s if it's like a um, I watch it a radio. <laughs> yeah, a radioactive monster thing that like gets I love huge. that stuff, yeah. Like yeah. that comic submarine. Or <laughs> you, you just give it a pass. And that's the difference. That's the difference between six, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, movies to the 90s and the 2000s is everyone was on board with trying to make the best possible thing. And then in the 90s, and maybe Mystery Science Theater has a little bit to do with this, the jadedness of in the room is people started making bad, low-budget things with the recognition of oh if this is bad we'll say we purposely made it bad market it the other way yeah yeah and so with all your friends are dead one of the producers chris morris who again as i said everyone wore a lot of hats in the movie he was a producer uh he played the killer he uh was an assistant on a lot of different things he his land is the land we shot the camping stuff and he cleared all that um, he plays the dark. He plays the brewery owner. He built the toilet in which he gets drowned in that we filmed in my garage. Um, he built that, and he did a lot of stuff. After he came to the screening that he came to, is he was like, I felt like they laughed at the appropriate spots that they weren't laughing at us, that they were laughing with the movie. And I was like, Yes, I think so too. Thank God, because like. Yes, if the movie turns into the room, I'm never going to stop that from happening. Like, Because any kind of success that allows you to make another thing, you're going to let happen. But like, I didn't, I don't necessarily want people to be like, oh my God, this thing fucking sucks. And you all all are delusional. Because there is, Tommy Wiseau at some point was very delusional thinking he was making Streetcar Named Desire. I'm tired, I'm wasted, I love you, darling. And made this mock fest, made this Rocky Horror Picture Show like interactive thing that he was not having zero clarity of thinking that you can make that sort of thing. So I don't have any um, ill will against like Marvel or the things that are dominating cinema right now. Um, Quentin Tarantino, I just watched an interview or a, 
a panel thing that he did at a conference in Hamburg, Germany, a couple months ago. And he said that he was asked about a question of the state of film currently. And he said, uh, if, if he made once upon a time in Hollywood, right before the pandemic came out in 2019. And his analogy is that that movie came out right as the window was shutting of what film would be. And he doesn't know that the window will ever open to be what film was the thing that he came in the industry that he came into 30 years ago. He thinks that might be a thing of the past and that he might not want to be part of that anymore. Um, for me, because there are so many out, there are so many outlets and he knows that too, because his whole like edging of being like, uh, whatever feature I do will be my last feature, but that's not necessarily the last thing I'll ever film. I'll go streaming or I'll go this or whatever. So he understands those outlets too. I think it's important that if you're not getting the heartfelt, um, emotional, like resonance movies that you're getting on the big screen, I have a, a, a feeling that we are close to being in, if we're not already in, the renaissance of like the indies 90 filmmaker boom. I think that's going to happen again. I think you're right. Um, and that's why I think it's funny that, that Quentin Tarantino would say that because he was a part of that. Um, Reservoir Dogs was made for like next to nothing, bought up by a studio, made millions of dollars. Um, yeah. The only thing that he had going for him was that he had the industry knowledge at the time to be able to get actors like Harvey Keitel and Tim Roth and Michael Madsen, who was actually popular at that time and you know, not, not as much. I and that's what we're, we're, we're hugely influenced by. And that is one of the reasons why the, the title cards have the days of the week is because we are influenced by uh, Kevin Smith, Robert Rodriguez, Richard Linklater, um, Spike Lee, Spike Jones, Quentin Tarantino. Those are the movies I grew up on because I had a, a brother who was five years older who was showing me those things yeah. because that was the, the cinema he was seeing. And he's like, when he came home from um, college, he was studying abroad in 1999 and he saw Dogma and he saw Chasing Amy. And he came home with two VHSs. And this is before he came out as being gay. He's like, this movie, and it was Dogma. He's like, I think you're really going to like. He's like, this movie, uh, I think you'll maybe eventually like. And I watched Dogma and Chasing Amy. And yeah, I love Dogma. And then, but Chasing Amy, I was like, I, I weirdly like this a lot too. And what's hard is movies of the mid 90s, that came out in 97, movies like In and Out with Kevin Klein, or even movies like The Birdcage, who feature actors playing gay who were not gay, get shit on now. But I think in perspective, you have to look at those and be like, those are so innovative. We look at comedy films in time capsules because everyone who celebrates Ghostbusters almost seems to forget how rapey Venkman is. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's, but that's the whole thing is it, we shift our society around the comedies that, that come out at certain times for sure. And um, we go back and we look at them with a different, oh, oh, and the thing is, is they are, they're time capsule films. They're, you're going back to that era. You know, we didn't know it was wrong. We've learned since then. That's sort of how you got to, you know, look at it. Um, and for sure, Ghostbusters has a few scenes in it that are like, okay. Um, what is it? There's even a, a ghost uh, EJ sequence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, people, it's like, it's, 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 the same <laughs> as, it's the same as Pretty Woman. Most people watch Pretty Woman when they showed it on TBS or USA, the TV edited version. And they're just like, oh, it's so nice that Richard Gere buys this whore and turns her into Cinderella. But because they watched it on TV, they forget the scene where that after he bought her that night and he emotionally connects with her, that he still like puts his hand on the back of her head and is like, Wah! and makes her give him fellatio because he paid for it because she is still a prostitute. But people forget that scene because they didn't see it on TV. So they have this different fragmented idea of what the movie is. Um, we just did, and this isn't the pimp, a podcast that I do, Real 90, where we talk about 90s films, where we have a, a random automated generator of 90s movies that we have to watch. We did American Pie. And I was worried 
that I was like, oh, this movie's probably not going to hold up. Comedies don't hold up. They're very time capsule. And what I was surprised about is, yes, it's led by four white guys. But what it does is, for a teen sex comedy, like I grew up watching um, John Hughes' movie, 16 Candles, which has a lot of problematic shit, yes. date rape and stuff and racism. Um, the Last American Virgin, which is very much through the male gaze. Fast Times at Ridgemont High, even though we followed Jennifer Jason Lee, it's very male centric. Um, and I like Cameron Crowe and I love John Hughes, but American Pie, they have a whole subplot about caring about the woman having an orgasm. Like female cunnilingus, or just cunnilingus, because I guess it'd just be oral sex is not expressed hardly in any movie. Like what movies do you see a man going down on a woman to ensure that she has an orgasm? And so the fact that they dealt with that is huge. There's hardly any gay bashing. Like that movie holds up way better than it should. It probably does hold up way better than it should. And I'll give you, I'll give you that. But there is also a scene where a non-consensual uh, taping. The webcam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We discussed that at length of the the technology being new. Watching it now, though, because I can only comment on watching it originally when I was younger, watching it with my parents and being like, oh, I can't believe we're watching a movie like this. And then both of my parents laughing hard at when uh, Rookie of the Year is going down on Tara Reid and making her come. My parents were like giggly and like slapping each other. And I was like, oh, no. Like, oh, I don't want to be part of this. <laughs> the webcam stuff, watching it now, I'm like, oh, man, we all are so familiar that this is the scene from American Pie. But I can only assume that when we originally watched it, we didn't think this was going to actually become a Dear Penthouse moment. Oh, yeah. Like, we thought it was leaning, like, oh, we think, like, the character wants this to happen, but she's going to shut it down. She's way out of his league. So the misdirection in 99 was that it, she's totally into it. She's into this awkward Jewish kid and that the stack of porn he has, like that was the mixed direction. Now it's hard to look at it through that gaze. And yes, he turns on a webcam and broadcasts it to everyone. And it's, it's, it's pretty skeezy now, but like almost besides that moment, I, I, I we, we, the main question we had was, I would love to sit in an audience, but well, I wouldn't love to sit in an audience of 14 year olds. I would love to hear what the response was from 14 year olds that see it now. Like I saw it when I was 14 to yeah. see if there's any emotional resonance that happens with them. I think what's good is that we're learning from it for sure. I mean, um, the thing is, is that you can go back to any, any comedy that you want. Like I, well, I watched Silver Street last week, uh, Gene Wilder, and, Richard ah. Blair, and yeah. I had no idea about that scene in the middle with Gene Wilder and blackface, you know, like um, that was a shoe surprise. polish, shoe polish, blackface. And Richard Pryor is there as if to be the conduit to say, this is OK, everyone. This yeah, is exactly. all right. And yeah. it's, it, it is. I got a black friend. He says it's yeah, cool. It's like, uh, like when you're watching it now, for sure. But like. I'm just glad that, like I said, I'm just glad that we're learning from those mistakes and that we can start moving forward. But the idea is like, you can't go back and, and go, and go, you know, it's sort of hindsight is 2020, mm -hmm. you know, like. Well, the, 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 the internet away. meme where they say that uh, you couldn't make blazing saddles nowadays. Yeah. And it's, it feels like kind of like an ultra right wing, like conservative thing to be like, Oh, why can't we say this stuff? But it's like, yeah, you can't make blazing saddles nowadays because you made blazing saddles when it should have been made like yeah. there's no reason to make there there's a reason to make different things that are topical now we shouldn't always be sitting with nostalgic that is my a little bit of my issue with horror is we almost look at horror with a conservative lens the best horror we never forget because it is topical and has a um, even if you don't on surface level get the meaning behind it, it's the reason why subconsciously certain things stick around and, are, and become classics. So like the best of the best have something that transcend what it, what it is on Front Street. And so 
so much horror nowadays is made with nostalgia goggles where they set it in the 80s or they set it in the 70s. Part of that, my brother and I have this conversation of, is it just to get rid of cell phones or is it just to, to allow misogyny and bullying? It's like black phone. His biggest issue with that is was like, he's like, I feel like they said in the seventies, just so they have an excuse to have the extreme bullying that they have. And I was like, maybe. Yeah. I don't I mean, know. I mean, to an extent, I, I think that um, you know, that's written by Stephen King's son, Joe Hill, mm-hmm. who I think has an affectionate love for that, that style thing. But I also, and maybe I'm. The same as Stephen King has an affinity for the fifties in greasers. Yeah. Right. Like so, it's the same thing. His is for the eighties and late seventies. I, I kind of related to the idea that, that maybe that kid is actually Joe Hill <laughs> and maybe some, some, some slaps happen, you know, like, I, I think that that's, I think that it, a lot of it has to do with um, what was acceptable for punishment is yeah. more or less what it is. Um, because I was definitely one of those kids that grew up at that time too. And I could tell you horror stories about my own dad. So it's like, Yeah. And, and there is, and you're always going to, um, so that's like Elm Street, besides the creation of Freddy, happening in 84, you know, you have the, the Frank Zappa, the Tipper Gore uh, trials about yeah. censoring of music and uh, the kids committing suicide and Dungeons and Dragons and all that, and the parents not understanding or connecting with their kids. Elm Street, like, that's what it's saying. It's about how parents aren't, list the transgression of the parents the kids are going to pay for and the kids are saying hey we're having an issue with this and the parents are like no we don't hear you we don't have time for it we don't put any credence on what your issues are because we don't think they're real they don't seem real we're dealing with bills we're dealing with divorce we're dealing with broken homes of the separation of the rockwellian family and so that's why i think movies like elm street texas chainsaw the um even the mid-2000s torture porn which i think get discarded like Hostel and Saw, like Texas Chainsaw is a common, like Texas Chainsaw and Last House and Left are commentaries on the Vietnam War being in your living room and that violence, the real violence being in your house. Those films are commentaries on that in the middle, uh, blue collar America losing their way. I think the torture porn movies of the mid 2000s are indicative of Guantanamo Bay and the Iraq war and Afghanistan war. So I think we will think of, yeah, yeah, I think we will think about those movies as well in the pantheons of horror that stands up. Night of the Living Dead, how much that movie is thought about as far as like race relations when um, the the casting only happened by happenstance. It wasn't written that that character was black it was based on the best actor came in and he's like that guy. And again, that puzzle puzzle piece putting together of independent film of being like, Oh, now that I have a black actor, it's not about just the young and the old clashing in the house. It's about his race and the old white man clashing. So then he evolved it, the story while he was making it. I have two weird soapboxes of like people that give to crowdfunding to make fan films I'm just like, stop giving a thousand dollars to never hike alone. <laughs> like, yes, you want to see a Jason movie that is better than the other Jason movies you have because it's a cool looking character. Like, if you're going to give money, give money, give money to me, give money to these new original ideas in horror that are exploring areas that we haven't seen yet. Um, in the same vein of people online bitching about the new Candyman movie being like, Oh, why did you have to drag drag Candyman into being PC and talking about like uh, abusive cops and, and race and blah, blah. And I'm like, did because you that wasn't in the original. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cabrini green and all of that. Like, yeah, that's none of that, that movie was, is so good. None of that had to do with any of that. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. It was just a straight up slasher. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's mind boggling. And that's, I mean, I get that's why. So that's like so much horror a bad horror movie is still more fun to watch than just a bad, like dramatic movie or especially a bad comedic movie because there are still some charm elements that you can find and like, but horror fans 
are almost their own worst enemy. But thank God for them because even the ones with that disposable income will spend their last dime on whatever yeah. property or IP. No, one of the things that I've always said is um, I will remember terrible movies and I will remember absolute masterpieces. Like those are the ones that that my memory jogs. But anything that like really like inserts itself in the middle, like just just to sort of like it, here's an hour and a half of just whatever. You're just going to go. Eh, it's forgettable. It, it's it's somehow worse than, you know, striking out, you know, that's how I feel about James Bond movies. My James, my favorite James Bond movies are the absolute worst James Bond movies <laughs> and the absolute masters in filmmaking that yeah. a Bond movie doesn't doesn't deserve. Middle of the road, like even okay James Bond movies, like meh, kind of forgettable. I will love a Diamonds Are Forever or a Man with a Golden Gun that have like exploit. I mean, which I mean, they were leaning into the exploitive natures of whatever filmmaking was the biggest at that time or at the drive-ins yeah. to get as much audience as possible. But like Diamonds Are Forever and Man with the Golden Gun, I will watch just as much or more than a From Russia With Love, Goldfinger, GoldenEye, Casino Royale, or Die Another Day. Fair enough. I have a different, I have a different settings on that one for sure. But <laughs> wait, wait, so what are, what are your, I'm mean, sorry, not I actually really day. like from Russia. I mean, um, no, no time to, <laughs> No, I do too. Yeah. For Marshall Club is my like as if I'm looking at and like die another day for me is like bottom of the barrel. And I've watched that every day. single time. <laughs> I meant I meant no time to die. I meant no time to die. Die another day, except for the opening where he's getting tortured. Yeah. That I really like, minus the Madonna song. That film is garbage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I meant no time to die. Um, but yes, for most of love is my number one James Bond movie. But number two might be man with the golden gun or diamonds are forever just because of how bonkers and fun they are diamonds are forever is one of the first bond movies i think i ever watched so i definitely remember it just based on that um well then sean yeah, connery's it's, like it's a, not over, he's not <laughs> overweight but he's like not in shape yeah well he, he's done i think that was his last one or right before his last one they might have dragged him back it's his last um Albert Broccoli production. Then he did Never Say Never Again, which is just a remake oh, of... Oh, uh, because he had to. That no, was he, he, he agreed to it. So it's um, Never Say Never Again is the reason why it's a remake of Thunderball is because Ian Fleming was sick when he was writing Thunderball and through uh, a court case, the guy who helped him write yeah. it got rights to be able to, to have ownership to it. So through MGM, he made Never Say Never Again, which was originally called Warhead. And they uh, offered Sean Connery so much money to do it. And he had a writing credit on it. And he said, uh, never, ever again will I play James Bond. And his wife said, never say never again. And that was it. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah. The, um, I Welcome actually- back to Bond Talk. <laughs> That's another one that's sort of weirdly over the top and bonkers and, and probably shouldn't. Uh... I, to me, it's better than Thunderball. I think like, so, too. <laughs> I hate the underwater fights in Thunderball. Nothing is more boring than people slow-mo punching like each other underwater for a half an hour. <laughs> Beautiful women in Thunderball and a great looking villain in Largo. But I think the movie Never Say Never Again is a much better movie. Bernie Casey as Felix Leiter is better than the old white-haired dude in Thunderball. Um, Rowan Atkinson, Rowan Atkinson. Yeah, I was gonna say that. is in Thunderball. You don't have the weird rape spa scene that's in Thunderball where it, it's just rape. Like, it is... Not, there's, yeah. yeah. It's just... Which, I mean... But we don't Sean talk Connery. about that because it's a James Sean Bond. Sean Connery is burning about comedies. In, <laughs> No, Sean Connery is burning in hell. Like, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> the, the difference between the two men of uh, Sean Connery was like in a Playboy article, I think a woman should be slapped every now and then to be kept in line versus Roger Moore, who had to take out a restraining order against his wife who physically abused him. Like that says everything you need to know about who the two, who those two James Bonds were. Yeah. Very cool. I love talking. I love talking anything movies. So, um, <laughs> 
I will talk all day. Elm Street's my favorite series. When people have asked, they're like, if you could reboot or uh, be part of any franchise uh, or a reinvention of a franchise, I don't say Elm Street because I would be worried that I would do it a disservice. The one franchise that I don't think I can make better, but I, I would really be interested to play in the world is Phantasm. Um, I love I, Phantasm, yes. I love that series. And one of my biggest disappointments, half of a disappointment, was when I got to talk with Don Coscarelli and I was nerding out being like, so in two and they do this and three when they do this and four, when you use the unused footage from one and they introduce this and one of the alternate universes is Jody died and Mike's writing with his parents to the funeral Jody. That's an unused clip from four, the from one, but used in four. And I was asking him all this and he's just like, yeah. He's like, I hate to have to say this, but we just made up the story each movie we made. Yeah. I never had an ultimate opus yeah. arc. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, that's so disheartening. That doesn't take away anything from the movies. But before comic books or even these Marvel movies had this like universe, I felt like Phantasm as a film series for horror nerds and sci fi nerds had that that we always saw the potential way more than what the movies necessarily were ne like purposely going towards. Oh, for sure. And I mean, I think that can be seen in a few of them, like um, that final Friday, Jason goes to hell. You get the um, nightmare on Elm street, uh, Freddy yeah. and at the end, bringing the, the mask down and stuff like that. And well, like, we, we was, broke it on our podcast, this old podcast I used to do. Adam Marcus is a friend of mine who wrote and directed um, uh, Jason Goes to Hell. And he told us, and now it's everywhere. I think we may be mentioned on the Wikipedia page for helping to break the scoop, but now he's talked about it a bunch, is Jason Voorhees, the Necronomicon is also in Jason yes. Goes to Hell. He said it was his intention that Jason was a deadite. That's why he keeps on coming back. That Pam Voorhees, Betsy Palmer in the original, dealt in the dark arts. That's how she brought her son back. That was the justification they had for, because there's that weird unexplained thing yeah. of um, mut mutant tall Jason from part one to part two. Like if he didn't actually drown, why was Pam Voorhees so pissed? Yeah. If he's just been living in the woods. And his thing was, is that she brought him back through finding the Necronomicon. And so I was just like, that's, I love Jason Goes to Hell. Yeah. Um, uh, why can't I think of his name? Who wrote the original Friday the 13th? Um, who just won the court case? Victor Miller. Victor oh. Miller. John Cunningham directed it. But Victor Miller wrote it. He had never seen one of the Friday the 13th sequels. And so we had him on as a guest on Cinema Toast Crunchcast to talk about Friday the 13th. And we were like, we'd love to have you back would you like to talk about one of the sequels? And he's like, I've never seen any of them. And so I wrote up a description of all the movies we hadn't done yet. And he picked Jason Goes to Hell because he's like, that one seems like the most interesting out of all these dumb sequels based off of the iconography that I created. Yeah. And he, and he dug it. Like, he liked it. He's like, from what I know, at least this movie tried something else. No, 100%. I think that that was the first one I really, I ever saw when I was a kid. I, you know, I think it was on like, you know, channel five or whatever at the time. Mm -hmm. And I just ended up seeing it on a random Saturday. And that's, uh, here I am now. <laughs> oh, and I'm wearing a Friday the 13th shirt, got, which is probably like Scooby-Doo and, and scream going on. Well, that's great. <laughs> Matthew Lillard. Yeah. Scream series. I love the scream series. I love one, two, and four did not love five. We'll see what six has to bring. Yeah. I'm with you. I, I'm actually kind of with you on that one. Um, but I'm looking forward to that. Ricky, thank you again. Um, this was great. I'm, uh, now I got to edit all this together. This is the longest interview <laughs> you've ever had. Three, three episodes. <laughs> we're getting, we're going to be cut off here soon, just like yeah, before. I gotcha. All right. Um, take care, man. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, sir.